um, and then hand over to the guys who actually know uh, what they're talking <coughs> about. So um, yeah, I'm, my name is Nino, I'm the CTO of uh, Sashaway. Uh, since we're a fairly young company, I would just want to yeah, just want to um, quickly say a few words about um, you know, what we do at Sashaway. So Sashaway is essentially a fintech company, uh, online digital wealth manager. So um, what we do is, uh, you know, a goal-based approach to savings. So, you know, as a customer, you can sign up. You say, okay, I want to save for retirement. Uh, we help you, first of all, to, you know, how to think about your, your saving goals. So, you know, how, what, how old, you know, do you think you are going to be when you retire? How much money do you need when you retire? And so on. And then based on this configuration, we create a portfolio for you. Um, and this portfolio we also use to invest uh, your money into. So you'll set up, for example, a recurring payment. Every <coughs> month you transfer whatever, $1,000, and we invest the money for you. So it's a so-called so robo-advisor, um, as it's an industry term, right? Um, just a few words for the you know, context of, of our tech stack. So uh, we're basically using Scala and Lagom in the, uh, in the uh, backend for the trading side of our application. So you know, it connects to the bank, it connects to the broker, and then we have a, a you know, front end uh, that re uh, consists of uh, Node.js uh, API layer, uh, MongoDB, and uh, React front end. So relatively uh, standard front end stack, and on the back end we decided because of the transactional nature of, of our business that it does make sense to go with a you know, event sourcing approach. And that's how we kind of ended up with the uh, Lagom framework, and that's where uh, Drew and Mick are going to tell you a bit more about how, how we're using it and what kind of were our learnings in, in, in doing so, right? Um, yeah, and with that, yeah. I'll just okay. hand sure. over to you. Drew. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just quickly make a start by introducing myself. Um, okay, my name is Drew. I've been a programmer for about eight and a half years. I, um, I mostly worked in investment bank, hedge fund, building the electronic trading systems. Um, I've been using Scala for last two years, including um, I've been using um, Akka library at work, still learning a lot. So, yeah. So that's just a quick intro about myself. Um, okay, so let me begin a talk on Lagom. Actually, I just didn't have enough time to memorize all the scripts, so I have to, to please focus on the screen rather than me. Okay, um, I think I'll, I better sit down actually. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Okay, what is Lagom? Lagom, in a nutshell, is the reactive microservices framework developed by Lightband. Um, it supports both Java and Scala API. Java version was first released last year, March, and um, Scala version was released last year, December. It is open source, but also the commercial support from Lightband is also available. Um, still in very early days, as, as I said, it's less than one year old. Okay, and um, some, let me, introduce some features um, that makes Lagom a bit unique as a framework. So <clears throat> Lagom favors the um, distributed persistent patterns in contrast with um, traditional centralized databases. So it encourages an event source architecture for data persistence. The default pattern for persisting entities take advantage of event sourcing with command query responsibility segregation, CQRS. I will talk about event sourcing and CQRS a little bit more in depth later on. Also, the framework emphasized that finding the right boundaries between the services, um, aligning them with um, bounded contexts, are the most important aspect um, in architecting microservice-based system. So um, it has very strong domain-driven um, tendency. And um, lastly, Lagom assembles a collection of existing and proven technologies and add values on top of them. So I'll talk about this um, in details later on. So it uses Play, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka to build um, the framework. So um, questions were asked, like, why did you guys choose Lagom when it's less than a year old? Um, so it's true, not many people want to be the first one to use the new framework in production. It's a fair concern to have. So let me explain to you our reasons to choose Lagom as our backend framework despite of these concerns. So. There were basically four things that I wanted to achieve in, in a new project, in, in this new trading platform. 
Um, those are productivity, performance, concurrency, and scalability. First, productivity, being able to code in Scala was a just very good start for me. It's, it's strong type system and concise codes was definitely a strong plus. And also, Lagom provides some handful features to run and test Lagom services locally in your machine in SBT. So um, you can do some cool stuff like incremental compilation and hot reloading of the services and so on in SBT. Performance-wise, I think JVM is one of the best virtual machines out there, so it was just enough. Concurrency, I just didn't want to go back into using thread and locks, so the fact that it's based on Akka was a huge plus. I'll talk more about Akka. Scalability, although I didn't exactly know what distributed persistent meant at that time, to me it just sounded like they, they um, Lagom prepared a lot for the linear scalability at the fundamental layer, so it actually uh, met all these four categories really well. And um, so let's talk about technologies, the underlying technologies of Lagom. So, um, so Lagom's backbone is composed with many industry-proven technologies such as Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka, and Play, of course. So Lagom did not re reinvent the message broker or persistent storage, neither it reinvented the actor model. They, they're all based on the proven technologies, and so Lagom, to me, it, it came as um, abstraction that is strongly opinionated on how to combine all this together to form a uh, microservices system, and JVM as well. <laughs> and another reason uh, we choose chose Lagom was that we agreed with its key ideas. So um, although I didn't have experience in ES or CQRS previously, we liked the Lagom's um, um, underlying idea that include event sourcing and CQRS and also its, um, its tendency toward reactiveness. So we felt that there would be a lot of advantages we can gain from this key concept, even if it takes extra effort to understand them and get used to them in the beginning, we believe that it would be a good investment for the future. And also I felt that um, Lightband must have spent lots of common, um, um, must have seen a lot of common patterns in the way people build successful distributed systems using Akka framework. So when Lagom came out, I thought that oh, finally Lagom came out. You know, after seeing all that, you know, um, best good practices and bad practices that are done in the industry, they finally came out with the open source framework that um, you know collect these best best practices from the industry and turn them into the open source framework. Um, also, we weren't really afraid to get our hands dirty and dig into any, solve any problems we encounter while using it. In fact, a few weeks ago, we encountered one um, bug in the code, and MIG actually committed the fix for it, so we were not blocked by it. This is one of the, one of the benefits of open source, open source framework. You can modify the framework and fix the problem yourself if you need to. Um, and lastly, the support from Lightband team and the community has been really great. In the Lagom Google group, I asked about 150 questions over the last six months. None of those questions were left unanswered. This is ex excluding the email communication I had separately with the community members to exchange ideas and to ask for help. And of course, some freebies from Lightband also helped us to stay lawyer. <laughs> okay, um, so I mentioned Akka framework is one of the important reasons for choosing Lagom, and you know I thought since many of you guys here are you know familiar with Akka and Actor model, I thought it would be good if I can explain a little little more about why Akka was the confi confident booster for me. So as I said, I spent many years developing enterprise system in the domain of financial trading. So many times the performance was one of the foremost requirement of the project. So we um, normally we develop multi-threaded program with thread and locks. And as many of you would agree, expressing concurrent programs using thread and locks is just not easy. Um, yes, there were some facilities developed to help with the issues such as concurrent collection, uh, latches and thread pools and all that, but still it was just relatively low level and prone to various kinds of errors like deadlock, starvation, and whatever. As a programmer, I can usually reason very well about um, the behavior of a sequential program, small unit of function, but as soon as multi-threading comes into the picture, it became difficult to reason about. So my seniors advised me to study this book of Java concurrency in practice. I studied it a number of times, but it was still very hard. And, and the problem is like not everyone's are reading it. So, so um, 
I was actually hoping if I could spend more time on implementing and thinking about the business features rather than worrying about data corruption and, and, and the state of the threat. I wanted to spend more time worrying about the state of um, aggregate, aggregate root, for example. So uh, that is when I started learning about Scala and Akka. So I just totally loved how Akka can provide lock-free concurrency, parallelism, and an extremely effective way of managing state. Also, uh, its message-driven nature um, seems like it's fitting very well to the distributed computing. So it, it, it was a paradigm shift for me. It simplified the concurrent programming by shifting my focus from how to achieve the goal to what goal to achieve. And as I became more familiar with Actor model, I found that Actor can be uh, very suitable for representing an aggregate root in domain-driven design context with messages representing the concept in the UV, uh, UV cutters language in domain-driven design uh, and using aggregate, uh, using actors as an aggregate. Um, so, and also Actor naturally applies the principle that only one aggregate should be uh, modified in one transaction. So, um, um, I think Mick will briefly mention about Actor in his, in, in his session, actually. So, and, but the, there were still uh, difficulties. I mean, so although, I, I mean, because I didn't have experience in building a, um, you know, microservices system from the scratch, in, in, especially in domain-driven design, um, domain-driven development style, myself, I intuitively felt that, you know, um, like, Akka can somehow help. Akka can somehow provide me a stepping stone to, to do all that. So I had this concept, but um, I believe that, you know, one can make good use of actors' message-driven nature to tackle the challenges of event-driven systems and just distributed system. And it also seemed like it fits very well for representing an aggregate route in DDD, as I said. But I just needed some guidance. I felt that Actor alone may not be sufficient enough to build a distributed microservices um, system. Because first of all, Actor and Akka framework are not type safe. And also, I wasn't quite sure how I can ensure the delivery of the message can be guaranteed with eventual <coughs> consistency. I did take a look at persistent Actor, but, but to, for me to just combine all this concept together to implement the production level, production quality microservices system, I just, I wasn't just um, confident enough or experienced enough to do that. And that is why I was so glad when Lagom came out and realized that it contains all the ideas that I had and provide, it provides the guard railed approach with very good default. Okay, so uh, now let me really talk about Lagom framework. As you probably have noticed, it's a pretty, pretty big framework. Um, it includes a lot of ideas and technologies. So I may not be able to cover all the details in the session. Um, I'll cover only the three important APIs in, in Lagom. So um, first one is service API, which provides a way to declare and implement services to be consumed by the clients. This is one of the most straightforward APIs out, out of three, so I'll make it very quick. And there is Message Broker API, which provides a distributed pop-up model that s services can use to share the data through topics. Um, lastly, there is a persistent API that provides event-sourced persistent entities. So let me go through them one by one. Lagom's, uh, so service API to begin with, Lagom services are described by a service descriptor. So um, this interface defines the two things. First one is how the services are invoked and implemented. Second is the metadata that describe how the interface is mapped to underlying transport protocol. Let me show you an example. Um, so, so this is a um, sample I, I've taken from our portfolio service descriptor, just a portion of it. And it shows the two endpoints currently. Um, one is the create portfolio and the other one is get portfolio summary. So I think this is pretty common features and patterns in almost any web framework to have, have some kind of, this kind of service descriptor to declare your endpoints. So I won't go into too much details, but I'll just mention one feature that makes Lagom service descriptor quite unique. 
that is um, your service descriptor interface and the actual implementation of it is kept in different projects to achieve the loose coupling. So as you can see, the um, service descriptor, which lives in portfolio service, uh, belongs to API um, project, and the actual implementation belongs to implementation project. So that's about service API. Um, let's now talk about the second API, which is the message broker API. So uh, message broker API provides a distributed pop up model that service can use to share the data. Um, topic is simply a channel that allows services to push and pull the data with each other. In Lagom, topics are strongly typed, hence both subscriber and producer can know in advance what the expected data will be. So in order to publish the data to a topic, a service needs to be declared in the topic in, in its descriptor like this, in this example. In this example, our pricing service is declaring that um, the three topics, price topic for price updates, FX topic for FX updates, dividend topic for any dividend events. Um, so Lagom is using Kafka as a message broker. Mig will talk more about that. Um, Kafka will distribute message for a particular topic across many partitions so that the topic can scale. Messages can, uh, message sent to different partitions may be processed out of order. So if the ordering of the message you are publishing outside um, your service matters, you need to ensure that the messages are partitioned in a way that order is preserved. Typically, you can achieve this by ensuring that um, each message for a particular entity goes to the same partition all the time. Lagom allows this by letting you to configure a partition key strategy. In this example, which I took from Lagom website, it uses um, it, it is it is telling Lagom to use post ID as a partition key. So, uh, primary source of messages that Lagom produce is the persistent entity events, which I'll talk in the coming slide. It takes a stream of events and adopt that. Um, to a stream of messages which sent to the Kafka message broker. In this way, you can ensure that at least once processing of events by both publishers and consumers, which allows you to guarantee a very strong level of consistency between your services. This point on inter-service consistency will be elaborated in more depth by Mick later. So, okay, let's now take a look at how we can subscribe to the topic. To subscribe a top, to the topic, a service just needs to call topic that subscribe on the topic of interest. And in this example, portfolio services interest in um, subscribing to the FX rates update event, which which is coming from the pricing service. And when you call topic that subscribe, you'll get back a subscriber instance. In this code snippet, we have subscribed to the FX topic using at least once delivery semantics. That means each message publisher to the FX rate topic is received at least once by the portfolio service, uh, but possibly more than once um, as well. So as you can see, it subscribed the closing FX rate updated message from pricing service and, and send that um, update to, to the portfolio to update the positions and prices. Okay, um, now let me move on to the persistent entity API. Actually, um, this is a, quite a big one. Um, before we go into details, I have to explain the three concepts to you. Um, first one is about aggregate root. So um, each persistent entity in Lagom corresponds to the aggregate root in domain-driven design. So it's important to understand what it is. And um, uh, second and third are event source and CQRS. So Lagom favors the decoupled and distributed persistency over the traditional um, data storage. So and event sourcing and CQRS are the techniques that Lagom promotes to achieve this goal. So when we design our systems, we often think in terms of models. We try to model the real things into our code. And in any systems with persistent storage of the model, there must be a scope for a transaction so that changes to the model um, happens in, uh, consistently and atomically. An aggregate is a cluster of associated objects that we treat as a unit for the purpose of data change. Each aggregate has a root and a boundary. The boundary defines what is inside the aggregate cluster. And the root is the only member of the aggregate that outside objects are allowed to hold reference to. In this example, the portfolio is the root of its aggregate that consists of stock positions, cash balance, and orders. 
By clustering these entities a as an aggregate cluster, we achieve the transactional consistency between these entities. For example, we must have a guarantee that when the buy order is settled for the portfolio, two things need to happen. One, stock position of the purchase stock need to increase because we just bought more. Two, cash balance need to be reduced by the amount we spend on buying that stock. So while treating stock position and cash balance as their own separate entity, um, it makes sense to cluster them together in the same aggregate route with the order as orders entity so we achieve this transactional consistency that I just described. And by making portfolio entity as a root of, uh, of the aggregate that represent this cluster, uh, we can feel safe about giving reference to this cluster to the external world um, using portfolio as a handle. So now we have defined portfolio as our put, um, aggregate root in, in, and, which, and I'll, I'll be stick to it um, in the coming slide as an example. Let's now talk about event sourcing using, using aggregate um, portfolio as our aggregate root. Event sourcing is the practice of capturing all the changes that happen to aggregate as events, which are immutable facts of things that have already happened. So in this example, when the customer first creates an account and opens the portfolio with StashAway, for example, it can be stored simply as portfolio created event. Of course, that event will carry all the required information like uh, account ID and uh, base currency and all that. Rather than the complex interaction that would have taken place in a traditional CRUD application like begin transaction, commit, uh, this and that, we just simply stored uh, it as a portfolio created event. And when the customer makes the deposit of 50K, for example, that also get captured as a domain event or as fund deposited event. Any state changes like this, fund deposit, security buy sell, withdrawal, and so, withdrawal, whatever, we capture all of them as just simply as events and store them in order of occurrence. And we use this event to accumulate, uh, that we accumulated to explain the current state of portfolio. So over the life cycle of portfolio, you, you will um, probably see like a lot of events accumulating like this um, um, since, it's, since the portfolio's um, burst. So a portfolio get created and then all the events that um, happened um, to the portfolio will, will um, for the left of all the events will become your current state. So um, let me show you a ex real world example. So this screen shows actual events that occurred to the portfolio persist enti persistent entity in, in our system. So as you can see on the left side, it represents the current state of this portfolio. And on the, on the right, si right hand side, the table is the event log, which al shows all the events that occurred to this state with the sequence number and timestamp on it. So the, the very first event that happened to this entity was a portfolio created event. And if you want, you can also take a look at content of each event in the event log like this. So um, you can actually look at the details of the event. Um, event sourcing, there, there are a couple of advantages of event sourcing that we, we really like. So event sourcing guarantees that the reason for each change to an aggregate instance will not be lost. This is a major difference to traditional crowd-based approach. When using traditional approach of serializing the current state of, a, of the aggregate to the database, we are always overriding the previous state. We just don't do that in event sourcing. We append to it. Um, however, um, so retaining the reason for every change that happened to aggregate since its birth it can, can give us uh, invaluable, um, can, can be really great use for the business for the following reasons. So first is reliability. It provides a 100% reliable audit log of the changes that made to the business entity. Second is uh, near and far term business intelligence, analytic discoveries, because it emits a lot of data, the facts about the, and the facts that happen to the business. You can make use of analytical um, analysis on them later on if you want. So, and the full audit log, as I mentioned, this is a feature that is particularly beneficial for a company like us. Nowadays, the regulatory requirement for financial institutions are very heavy. And having this full audit log as a feature, uh, which 
basically shows every state change that occurred to the platform can play, play very handy and save us a lot of times over the time for, for regulation and compliance purpose. And traceability, debuggability, you can trace all the events and, and you can actually debug through it. Replayability, you can replay the events to recover the state. So even if you lose the current state, you can always um, go back to um, events to, re to refer current state. And um, if you want, you can also use it in a way that you can you only replay back to up, up to a certain point in the time to, to see what the state was like at that point. And lastly, um, event, because events are appended, um, events are persisted in an append-only fashion, it's extremely fast. So um, in this, and this is how a portfolio persistent entity looks like. As you can see, I have overwritten the three abstract type members, which are um, command, event, and type. Uh, uh, command, event, and state. Sorry. So um, command is the, the superclass of the command that this portfolio entity will accept. And event refers to superclass of the events that portfolio entities, uh, entity will emit. And state is the state of the portfolio, which um, is, is the placeholder of other entities that I just described in the previous slide, like uh, positions and cash balance and so on. And as you can see, the initial state there is an abstract uh, method that represents the initial state of entity when it's first created, when the persistent entity is first created. And the behavior is the method that returns the behavior of the entity, which I'll explain. So the function that process incoming commands are registered using on command method of the actions. And you should define one command handler for each command class that portfolio entity can receive. I'll show you. So, so, um, so the usual um, workflow that's going to happen on an entity will be like this. So command enters and it emits a band and it becomes a new state. Uh, so let's take a closer look at the not traded variable, which represents the behavior of the portfolio when entity uh, uh, of the portfolio when it's not yet created. So it has one command handler that handles the created portfolio command, and has one event handler that handles portfolio created event. So in the command handler book, you you will see that ctx dot then persist command. This then persist command will persist the portfolio created event to our message log, uh, sorry, to our event log in Cassandra. And when this event has been persisted successfully, only then the current state needs to be updated by applying the event to the current state. The function for um, updating the state are registered within on event block. So here we are registering the details of the portfolio to the portfolio st state and returns a new state. So it, it, it goes like this, create portfolio command comes in, it becomes portfolio created event, and it, be it becomes a new portfolio state. Uh, and then you will see this kind of event in your Cassandra message, uh, event log. Um, so there are a few drawbacks with event sourcing. Firstly, uh, when you don't have deep understanding of the business that domain that you are building for, it can be quite difficult to, um, to reason about the potential um, events that can happen. And also since it's relatively recent concept to most people, there is a cost and the risk of introducing this to your tech team. And, but the biggest dis disadvantage of event sourcing for our specific use case in, in SashOA is the information retriever. So imagine if you have 1,000 portfolios in the system and each portfolio has on average, say, 500 events. And we want to period periodically query the system to find out how many Apple stocks does Stash Away currently have. It will be difficult for us to query the event logs to do this. We have to query the event log to get the, all the events that's related to our security position. And then we have to uh, actually go one by one and, and sum them up. And, and with the database like Cassandra, it, this kind of um, group by operation is not supported. So, and this is exactly why we are using CQRS pattern to tackle this problem, which I'll explain later. So what is CQRS? Um, so CQRS tells us that our application can be divided into two data models, command model and the query model. So we have already seen the command model in our previous slide. Um, so the, the, this side we have already seen, the command enters and it emits the event. So, so the update data store refers to events being emitted in our case. 
but in the query side, we have API that is read only. So, uh, and this read side will uh, subscribe to the changes that happen on the write side and will, uh, will reflect that changes on its read only, um, on, on its read side storage. And, and normally that table or the view is optimized to so serve uh, a, a query, business query. So, um, I'll sh so this is an uh, example of read side processor that we have in um, um, portfolio, portfolio service. So, um, so as you can see, um, it extends the read side processor and you have to declare the type of event that, that yes? A really quick question. Sure. Please outline somehow which parts are, you know, something that you build and what which parts are. Sure, sure, okay. So, so um, out of this part, so this Cassandra session, reside, and uh, are given by the Lagom framework, and this po position DB handler is the one that I uh, built. And reside processor. Reside processor is given by Lagom. So, uh, so reside processor with w w which we declare the event type that we are interested in subscribing to. And uh, in this example, what I'm doing is when security purchased event arrives at this processor, it forward that event to the position database handler to update the total security holdings table to, 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 to serve um, precisely that query that I just um, described, like how, how many Apple stocks we have currently in StashAway. Um, position DB handler is nothing but just a uh, uh, interface to Cassandra database storage, so it will execute the insert statement like this when, when it's called. And, and then you create the repository interface that connects to that um, table that I just showed you um, to, to solve any business queries. So, uh, so in this way, we, op op we just op achieve the optimized read side view from the static table compared to dynamically um, event source to view. Okay, so uh, that w that's about it. In this talk, I, I just um, touched on why we chose Lagom, and, and I described three APIs. And, um, and in, in doing that, I, I gave you a very high-level overview of aggregate root and event sourcing and CQRS. Now, Mick will elaborate how Lagom helps to achieve the consistency within your microservice systems. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, oh. So if I can briefly introduce myself. Okay. Ah, okay, thank you. <coughs> Hello? Okay. Um, okay, hi, my name is Nick. So briefly about myself, I worked at... Sorry, sorry, me. Oh, it's, it's not ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. so my name is Nick. And I worked in Redmart before, so we have a bunch of Redmart people here. And we're in the Lazada, so don't forget to sign up for LiveUp. <laughs> and um, now I work in StashAway, and we have openings too, so if you like, I'll talk. So I want to talk about maintaining consistency in microservice systems. So one of the hard part of microservice when you have like things decoupled is that how do we maintain consistency of data as you throw, throw, flow from one domain to the other? So I want to separate the talk into so um, in the columns wise, we have the separation within the microservice and outside. So that means within your domain and across the domains. And then I want to look into the consistency model that each of these parts take. So particularly the Lagon persistent entity that Drew talks about, which is our main actor. Um, actor, like main, main guy, right? Um, that it actually has um, strong consistency and we get linearizability out of it. And in the last um, role, we have uh, eventual consistency world where um, we have the read side, which is the query part of the CQRS, and we can use it to implement a long-running business process. And when we go into the eventual consistency part of the outside world, then we have message pops up that Kafka out of the box from Legum like, helps. Excuse me. Mm. So, okay, let's talk about first. Um, Within microservice, a strong consistency, and we have our persistent entity of Lagom. So how is it achieved in this framework? So as we know, um, we have Actor. So Actor is known to be a share nothing model, and it serially processed the message. So let's say we have Alice as we build our domain of a customer, 
And so we might have a lot of concurrency, concurrent um, uh, commands that come in, but Atlas will only process things one at a time because we have a nice mailbox. And once we finish one message, we'll continue to consume the other. So locally, we have no concurrency issue. But, well, now we're in a distributed world, but we have things in a cluster, right? So if suppose we have two Alice's and Alice receive multiple messages, multiple commands at the same time, how would it, we handle it? So actually, it's a sharding without any replication. That means within our cluster, we might have multiple JVMs, multiple applications that are running, but Alice only live on one of them. So let's say in your system, you have a set, you have like all your customer IDs, they will be equally distributed into your different application. So, the, the, so we have stateful application in this way. So that means when a request that comes in and wants to talk to Alice, if the, if the request go to node one, so it's one that has Joe and Bob, it will be redirected to Alice. So in this way, we can be sure that there only exists one Alice in the whole cluster. And that's how we get um, strong linearizability in um, persistent entity. And I mean, of course, with the events that get emitted and, and how it's applied to the state that you has described, and that's the, the right that we're actually operating on top of our, of, on, in our actor. So it looks so good. But what's the cause of this linearizability and how we can minimize it? So as we, as we have sharding with no replication, so when one node leaves, what happened when the node that Alice lives on died? So in Lagom, these entities, the, the IDs are redistributed to the, to the, run, to the, to the applications that are still running. And of course, um, there's a delay that you, know, you have to reconstruct your events so that you can have a living entity of Alice. But this is optimized because the, we have snapshots that we can only replay, we, we can replay the set of events that we can still apply to snapshots. So basically, we don't have a long list of events that we have to replay in order to bring, the, bring Alice up, even when she moves from one, um, when she moves from staying in one application to the other, from, from one node to the other. And we also have latency. So we get availability in this sense. I mean, we get less delay because we have optimized read view and we are able to redistribute our entities. But when we have network partition, so because we are um, sharding with no replication, and that means when our cluster got split, a set of our custom, a set of our entities might not be reached, right? And then now we 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 are not able to serve our clients until actually we um, this partition is healed, whether it's by a cluster management tool or it's by human intervention that we can heal this partition. So this is the downside, right? And um, so now I, I want to reason about the Lagom, this model of um, distributed um, system. So a lot of us know CAP theorem, right? Like CAP, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And we say that we can choose two out of three, whether it's um, C CP or AP. And it receives some criticism that it's too binary. I mean, it doesn't allow for granularity of, let's say, if we look at availability, we might be able to look at it in terms of delay instead. So I would like to invoke um, delay sensitivity framework that Martin Kleppmann talks about. I mean, it's a very good paper. But um, the idea is that the stronger consistency model that we take, the higher the, um, our system becomes sensitive to the delay. So in the paper, he lays out very uh, neatly about different uh, model, which, um, so if you look at the first one, linearizability that um, persistent entity actually has, so we have strict, strong con um, um, consistency. So we have um, large delay, the our system will be sensitive to delay both on the right side and the read side. And then, um, because you know all these operations have to happen as if it happens within the same unit of time atomically. And then we have sequential consistency and causal consistency, which actually is rest less relevant to this. And I'm also afraid that I will explain it um, incorrectly. But to briefly mention sequ sequential consistency, it's where when you create a lot, when you create writes, and then you make sure that the read side that you have, you see things, um, that you see your write side in order. And then causal consistency is that only the one that has um, causal relationship has to be ordered. 
And um, it achieves, so with this uh, weaker model of consistency, our system becomes less sensitive to delay. So if you think about, let's say, sequential consistency, let's say we have a Mongo where we have a primary and we have uh, slaves, and the right side have to coordinate, and that means when it coordinates, and if there's a lot of delay in the system, in the network, it will be sensitive to the delay because it has to coordinate all the right sides. But on the read side, um, the client is able to continue reading it because, um, 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 and, and it, the client will get um, the delay as much as the replication lag, but he, he can always read um, the, the values. So now I want to add another axis, which is actually, this is just my thought and might be incorrect, but has nothing to do with Martin Clement's paper, which is the scope. That means if we know that our system is sensitive to the delay, so how do we reason about this delay? So I think maybe we can think about it in terms of scope. So the scope of operations, right? So if you look about, if you think about distributed transaction, and if we want to get um, strong consistency, we know that this is very expensive. It requires a lot of network coordinations, and if our system is slow, if the network is slow, we'll have a very slow um, system. And now, if we move domain, we limit our domain closer, maybe you think of the first one as a monolith where we have, we execute things across the domains, and then we move to like a microservice where we still own our own domain. We still have table locking because our underlying representation of the domain, it's separated into different tables. And then we have, oops, and then we have append only log and in memory operation, like, hmm, what is that? So it is a persistent actor. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need a lot of coordination. It's append-only event. And then those events apply into your um, in-memory representation of your state. So it's very quick. And so basically, you have a very small, small scope, but then you still suffer the um, sensitive to the delay because you want the strong consistency in your um, persistent entity. But can we do better? What if we want to have replicated persistent actor? So that means, so I mentioned previously that we are in the model of um, sharding without replication. And as a result, we suffer from availability because if the part of the sh shards are not available, then we become less available. And then we have replicated persistent actor. So, and I think Herdy might know about it uh, because um, I heard that you might know about it. Um, so replicated persistent actor, I think there's a framework called Event Trade, which actually was written by the same author who wrote um, Archive Persistence in a, its early stage. So the idea is that we can have replicated event logs. That means compared to what we have in our Archive um, Persistence, our, event, our actors cannot share the events, but because we can distribute them across different locations, or we have rep so now our actors can share the events. But when we share the events, we share the event logs, and then we become more available. But how do we coordinate concurrency? If one service, if one call go to Alice in node one, and the other go to Alice in node two, right? So, if we define our actor in um, as a CRDT conflict-free replicated data type, so those can be reconciled without network coordinations. That means eventually um, they will uh, arrive at deterministic state. Or I think Eventrade also has a nice API that allows you to resolve these versioning conflict. But why, one, why would one still choose a stronger mode of consistency that Legon provides? So I think if business requirement is that you need a strong, um, strong consistency, so I, I guess we have to. <laughs> and then I think it corresponds more strongly with the share nothing model of actor, and as well as the strong consistency boundary of the concept of the aggregate root um, concept in DDD. That means um, we must be able to you know, maintain this. And so if, if you use a replicated persistent actor, when you receive a command and you consume the events, you might get events that actually got generated from that was a result of the command from the other instance. Now, um, yes, so that was um, linearizability in the domain that we care about. Right? And this is the right side, is the right side of the CQRS, is the C part, C part is the command part. And now we go to the read side. So we are in the eventual consistency world, and Andrew has mentioned about um, Legom's nice abstraction of the read side processor. 
So to put this in graphical way, so from down up, we have transactional boundary, which is a strong, uh, which has strong consistency. And then that is when our events got emitted. And when events got emitted, that means things actually had happened and we had to obey it, right? And those stream up into the event processor and eventually it goes into your table and that is your read site table. But what is to note here is that T here is not equal, it's not equal to zero. So of course we are outside our strong consistency boundary and there will be a delay that we have to embrace at the read side. So, but, so to be eventually consistent, we, we not only embrace the delay, but we must make sure that the operations, the events that we want to apply to our tables, that we um, have exactly one semantic, that we don't want duplicate events or we don't want to miss any events, right? So how do you do that? Legom has its own um, offset. So each event comes with an offset and event processor has to keep track of which offset that it has processed. So we both update the read side that we care about and we persist the offset. That means, and they happen atomically. Um, so we do have transaction. So like what did I say transaction? So yes, so Legom use um, Cassandra light um, transaction. So it's, it's atomic. That means you know all are succeed, all failure. And but what about performance, right? Um, but it's okay because we already say that t is not equal to zero. So t is unbounded um, finite time. So once our business requirement is embracing this eventual uh, consistency model, it's okay to that that we have performance cost at the at the read side. What is offset mean? Like, what number? Right. Exactly. So it's a um, time-based UID, and it, it's um, given. To, out of the box of Lagom, when you emit an event, it comes, it got persisted together with a time-based UUID. What happens if we say out of order messages, events in that case? Right, so it will not be out of order. Um, the event message has a clear sequence number and because things get processed in actor and events got persisted, so you know that the com commands that come in and the event that come in comes in order that you expect. And underlying Lagom, um, I think it uses um, Cassandra read and write a quorum. That means before it returns, you're guaranteed that the events will be there. So, and you can also use this to achieve long running business process. That means if we think about other business process or side effects that you want to create, it's something that you're okay with um, getting the delay. So you can have the same kind of um, mechanism where you have an offset that tracks which events have been further processed. But because of side effects here, it's not a persistent side effect that we can commit together with our Cassandra to have a atomic transactions of the offset and the actual things that we want to operate. So that means what could happen is that, okay, we create a side effects and then our system crashed before we could commit the offset. So that means when the system comes up again, it's like, oh yeah, I haven't seen this message. I haven't seen this event and we replay the event again. So we do have, um, nice consistency of our events will, that our events will reach whatever operations that we want to continue, but um, it will be at least once the delivery semantic. So the consumer side has to be idempotent, which I assume a lot of consumer sites, even in REST implementation would have to, uh, would should assume idempotency anyways. Um, now we're going to the wild west, not really like the outside our domain. So how, when we communicate with other services, um, what, what do we do here, right? Um, so when we talk to other surveys, I would say like they actually only care as much as the events that you care about. So have you had colleagues that come to you like, hey, can you expose a get endpoint for us because we need to enrich our data with your, we need to enrich our domain with your domain, right? So um, how can we solve this? Because when we have this get asynchronous communication, we have time bound with the other service. That means the two services have to be present together. So we are bound, we are more fragile to, to failure. So when you do a get endpoint, you actually was asked, you, you are asking for the static view of the domain that you care about. But if you can emit the events, so the, your client can actually create a local view of materialized view. So basically there's a materialized view out of your service. And some people would, would say that, you know, having duplicate source of data might lead to inconsistency, but I'm saying that it would be consistent because we have a nice mechanism of ensuring that this event stream will eventually reach your client. 
And what about when you, your friends say like, hey, can you call this event when you finish this application? Can you call this endpoint when you finish this application? This, this, this process? Or can you raise an event when you finish something? So when, let's say, if you persist something into your database, so you're done with your operation, but your friend still cares about um, some events that they want you to continue to propagate. So what guarantee do we have? Like if we finish, if we crash right after we finish our operations, can we replay the events again to make sure that we can still um, call our friends? So in this way, our system also become, um, in, can, can become inconsistent in when it crashes at the place that you do not want it to be. Um, now, so if we see that events are the only source of change in the system, and then these, I would say that these propagation are sufficient to whatever outside world communication would care about. And because your state would only be changed by events. So if you, you say that you want something out of me, I should be able to get it from my events as well. And I think this is similar to some implementations of when people want to stream the um, replication of log of database. So if you think of database also as a state of the application, and then when it wants to replicate itself and then it would stream these um, op logs to, to, to its a replica to create the same events, right? So this is similar where those operations, those database operations, is actually the events that our system care about and what other systems care about. But here we have events that are more expressive. We raise the level of abstraction out of the database, not tied to the database, and then it's semantic rich, we can put in a lot more in our events that, it's, uh, that has business, clear business um, logic embedded in it. So, and, yes? So, so you asked to, can you expose me uh, an endpoint that, is, that I can just call it get? Yes. It's no. It's, it's yes, so, okay, sorry. So you say you expose the whole event, you answer to other, other services, I give you my whole event stream, and then you, you pass it, right? Right, so actually let me qualify that statement. So um, you can adapt your events. Of course, you can transform your events into the message that you can put in the, the you can put in topic. So you do have ability to <coughs> abstract certain details that you don't want your client to care too much about. That's one thing, and the other is that, I mean, this is only the case where you actually want your system to be um, less time bound. And I think, I, mean, I, don't, I don't advocate this to be the solution for everything. And let's say if your custom, if you actually have this for, let's say a client, like a consumer, let's say in Redmart, you actually want the um, item. I'm not saying that we cannot expose get endpoint to serve clients items, right? It's not like the front end should have their own cache and rebuild these states. But as I say, like in, internally, if you want some kind of data, metadata to enrich your objects, then it's okay to have, and if your business is okay with this delay and with that the d data might not be the most up to date, I think it's a, it's a valid case that can decouple your system in time. Right. Your yep. consumer, the other team, yep. the team that wants to call into your service has to do a lot of work, right? So, yes, that's correct, but they can do the work just enough to satisfy the requirements. So a lot of time, I think when we expose and get endpoint, we have the problem that we expose too much, and then we also add, so what one could do is to define endpoints to be very specific to the client, to give only the information the client care about, but then it's not general enough. But then over here, um, the client can build their local view to retain only the information that they care about as well. <coughs> so, we yes? Caching then server level? Why should client worry about caching local view? Uh, why should client care uh, about? Why should, should local view? Should so if, if be at server level so that all clients can access. If two, three clients are. Uh, querying the same get endpoint, right? Then server can directly so I, on the cache, right? Yeah. So um, as I said, I think this is a trade-off that you can decide. It gives you an alternative that allow your system to be less fragile. Because if you still continue to, I, I think I, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think also the with the problem with not problem the thing I. Let, like, the reason why I less favor get, like I favor um, 
other services to actually subscribe to uh, to my service through Kafka. The reason why is that actually I think get is synchronous, and and you know like if you subscribe to the event, um, you know as as Nick mentioned, you know you can. Uh, the bigger problem I see is if you give out your own business events, right? Is the complete loss of abstraction. Right. Like the client only wants to know how many Apple shares does this user have now. Right. And then he gets back 500 events uh, of 20 different types, right. which he doesn't really need to know. Right? right. That's a very valid point. And indeed, we can filter out. I mean, within the before we publish the events, we have really nice, we have full control to decide to filter out the events that we don't want to expose and to convert into a different message type. And that's an and that is as easy as converting one case class to the other before we put it in the queue. So it doesn't have to be the whole events that have ever happened in our system. Also, so we have multiple topics, right? So we, in fact, what we do is for the services, they expose different topics for different themes or type of messages, sort of, right? I mean, and then you can describe to whatever you're interested in. I mean, you can even use Kafka streams to like uh, pre-process on some of the messages that you're talking about. Right. And also the entities coming out of persistent uh, events coming out of persistent entities are not the one that's actually um, sent out to the services. Actually, as we mentioned, uh, we have another layer of abstraction. That's why Livebomb actually promotes you to separate between API project and implementation project. And in API project is where you actually define your public contract to the world. And there you can actually have different like like case class with the less number of fields in there. For example, if you want to filter out. Right. Yeah, but I think that's a very valid point that when one says that, oh, different people have local view of yourself, I, as a service owner, I became a little bit worried. Like, I don't want to make sure that I will, you know, have to inform you everything when things change. So I want to have the owner, ownership of my data. But I think we can appropriately put some abstractions over it. So, um, so I was talking, so yes, so e we can have at least one delivery when we publish to Kafka topics and it used a similar mechanism of offsets and similarly where we cannot have atomic um, operation of publishing to the Kafka topic and committing the offset, then we have at least one delivery and client should be prepared to be um, an input and consumer. So yes, um, in this section, I'm explaining about how we can reason about this uh, our Lagom system and where the things be, has strong consistency in the blue area and things propagate to the read side and we can think of the green box as just a materialized view whether it's the outside world or whether your, your, um, your own read side events and those are achieved through event stream. Thank you. Yes. I mean, the content environment, so, but uh, you, you just know you, you quickly mentioned that there's some reconciler, which actually you can reconcile your job can um, expand more on like, uh, how could you resell, uh, reconcile your maybe data or, uh, you know, if any event is missing or in the worst case, maybe your server suddenly shut down, so maybe you have some thing you have to reconcile. Right. So, uh, so are you referring to this? Uh, when it's resolving? Yes, yes. So yes, actually, this is not Lagom. So this is alternative way that one could implement, but has a weaker consistency model. Oh. So, so this is just a purely as an alternative that I put it here. Oh, okay. So and so therefore, I would not be able to answer your questions about oh. how these um, version conflicts get resolved. Because in Lagom, um, you will never have um, conflicts. Yeah, because everything is um, linearized and you can have full okay. control. Yep. So what, what I'm talking about, if you want to reconcile your data, maybe you have to have some external logic to handle that. Like, uh, it's not in the local ecosystem. Maybe yeah, what, we, what, we, what we in fact do is, for example, for reconciliation on a business side, right? So yeah. that you will have a read side, for example, that tracks, for example, all the incoming, outcoming cash, mm, cash yes. transaction that, that lead to a certain balance state, right? And then, at the end of the day, you can compare that state to your actual oh, bank okay. account balance. Oh, that's what the business is. I see, yeah, yeah. It's right. not actually in the framework itself. Okay, yeah. thanks. So, Chu, so, any uh, questions? Uh, I think I've asked a couple of questions, so I'll try to go one by one, but you might determine another. So, the first question is, 
Um, are there any tools that log on or something you built that help resolving problems with like poison messages or poison events or something like that? Basically, the event that consistently crushes your, your event consumer or an actor and everything. Right. Is there something to talk to? Yeah. So, yep. So, when we have inconsistent data and then you're not able to process it, I don't think there's a nice abstractions for now to put them in a dead letter queue. And we're actually still exploring of how to resolve that problem. But um, one way of resolving this is to actually, if you know what could potentially go wrong in your system, we can model them as events that actually has happened. And indeed, but it can be events that does not have to mutate your state. But it can be events that inform or further notify that we do see some inconsistency. So we, we abstract the, um, so, um, so let's, let me put it this way. It's like failure as an event, like some invalid data corruption. Oh, something, so like, to give you an example, recently we had a case where the um, event ca command came in. It was trying to reduce the um, cache balance. So it, it actually like, published the cache ba balance decreased event. And then according to our logic, that event actually need to be applied to portfolio state to actually reduce the balance. But due to the rounding, uh, it was it was uh, less. It was short. My portfolio state portfolio was short by 0 0.1 cent. So 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 it couldn't actually persist that event. I couldn't actually apply that event on a straight state. So so when that happened, I, actually I was like a bit panicking. Like I mean, this is like oh what the fuck. I mean, so but so what we did was like we let that event to just keep hanging in there to like it's it's just keep trying to um, apply that event to the state. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And then while this guy's busy, re keep trying. I actually released a new code to actually just corrupt the data. Actually corrupt the state. So now the state goes below zero, zero um, low negative balance, which is uh, like theoretically wrong, but we actually corrected by appending the um, fix event, like, like increase cache balance event. So, so one way of handling the poisonous message. Sir, yep. Yeah, what's the granularity of this failure? Did it crash only the single persistent actor or? Yeah, just a, that, that actor. Yeah. It, the failure is isolated to that actor instance, yes. Parts from the question. So basically, with event source, there's a problem with event source approach when you are basically have to keep everything backwards compatible to the beginning of time. Sure. You need to replay all your events and stuff. Is there some solution you have found? Yep. So I think Ladom does think about that and it provides a, um, a API to actually deal with event migration. But it is. Um, yeah, so it does have support for event migration. That means for the, the events from the history that you have, you can specify at which generation, at which version, which kind of um, um, functions you want to apply up to the most recent version of the event that you have. But do you still have to keep you know, some kind of package you know, jar somewhere to be able to process that event? Or is it modifying the data? How, how does it work in more detail? Right, so... Um, I can't speak, uh, speak for Lagom, but uh, we use the Venturin, and what we do is we actually get framework uh, compatible schema, mm -hmm. so that uh, basically uh, when we deserialize stuff from the events, we actually can recompose it to whatever minutes that we have. So but that's basically keeping track. Yeah, yeah I don't think yeah, mm -hmm. there's no other way. Right. Yep. Sorry, the question from the back. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I want to ask if the right side node fails, <laughs> right side. No. So let's say if the right side fails, it could fail because of let's say Cassandra, the the, the tables or the persistent. Does Lagom um, re-elect one of the other nodes in the right? Right. So I think that is purely configurable by your underlying database because what Lagom provides is basically a way for you to update your read side, and then your actual API that you actually care about, you can implement it in your own way. And therefore, if it fails, um, it will be the matter of the underlying persistent technology that you choose to implement this um, read side. Okay, so, so I 
Actually, I was uh, referring to the right side. Oh, the so right. The right side fails. Does not on. Right. So. Um, the right side then you're referring to when the message comes into the persistent actor that we care about, right? So if that node fails, um, Lagom will automatically rebalance the entities to the existing running applications. So let's say in the example where we have Alice, so if the node that Alice died, Alice and her friends will be distributed to the remaining nodes. And then, then the client... I think it relies on Akkad clustering to, to do that, but like... That, that is the area where we are still investigating further. Right. So, yeah. so uh, actually another question, because uh, the, if the message broker uh, is configured to be at least once semantics, mm -hmm. then how do you handle duplicate events? So that's a good point. Um, I just cached the ID. Like, like, so I looked at the, um, this book of like, uh, enterprise architecture, whatever, that explains how to handle the identity issue. And I looked at it, it just says to cache. So like, that's what I'm doing. And then, so I think like over the time, if, if we cache too much for like, I don't know, like 1,000 IDs or whatever, I think we'll need some kind of mechanism to actually uh, trim out the first 500 whatever to that, um, uh, messages that we have to, to free up the memory space. but. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't see any other way, like, ways to actually handle that. Right. So, yeah. so, so and you make the consumer responsible. Yeah. Check the offset. If the consumer has seen the offset before, it will not. No, the actual, actually, not, not like offset. It's more like a business layer. So, so now, for example, if the deposit request come through, it will, have, it will carry on the deposit ID with it. And then I'm like, oh, OK, but by the way, I already have this message in a processed deposit ID sequence. The U sequence of UID already has it. Like then, I just ignore. Then I just lock the warning. Say, oh, I got a you know duplicate message, and just right. Yeah. And I mean that that would be the case for a long-lived object. Mm. So if you have a short-lived object, then I mean you can design. You can also design your domain into a more granular way. Like for example, some of our system, it's very time-related. So we could. And some of us do implement the domain where the entity is specific to, let's say, this month. And then it can cache as much as data as it's like. And as you mentioned, if some of our entities actually has these, um, and <coughs> these IDs as a business value already, it's not really an um, irrelevant data that we just do it for the sake of item potency, but you actually have that um, value inside your nested object already. So yeah. Uh, I was just wondering whether the duplicate event is good. The problem when you assemble the event history. So you could discard, but if you were to choose to keep it, then the duplicate event could be could be a problem in the event. Right, just to clarify, this duplicate event is not the event that got stored as the main source of event that we used event source, mm -hmm. but the message here is the the, the Kafka message that yeah. that one could consume. So the damage, if it were to corrupt anything, it's purely within your entity, and you have expressive power to actually program it in the way that you like. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, yep. Uh, how would you handle uh, two phase commit? Like, if you needed to go to the bank and deduct? So, so, actually, that was the biggest challenge for us when we first adopted this Lagom. And actually, um, you have to think very differently now. <coughs> like, I mean, so, so I'm coming from the background where I always begin everything with begin statement and do so many insert and update and either you so the, that's how you achieve, achieve the atomicity either you do it all or fail or but actually what you have to do in, in, so I'll give you a good example so you actually have to re, um, think in uh, you have to actually think um, as closely as the real business um, uh, activities for example so say okay um, when I first designed my Lagom trading system, I was like, I designed in a way that um, my trader service just go to the market, like assuming that portfolio has cash balance, and then just buy it, and then and then and then ask like ask for portfolio service to accept the purchase security. But there was a scenario, there was a case where it, portfolio doesn't have enough money. Like like why did you go and buy it? You know that kind of scenario. So actually, you I actually 
don't realize that, oh, okay, you have to actually think very close to how actual um, stock brokers would operate. What they would probably do is they would probably call the portfolio owner and then, and then they were like, okay, I'm about to make a 1,000 buy order for Apple. Do you have money? And then and if the, he goes like, okay, I have money. Can you reserve it? So you have to actually reserve it. And then, and then like, the, by after confirming that you actually have the enough uh, reservation in the cash balance, you go ahead and buy and settles it. So, so, so that is how we solve the distributed transaction in, in, in very, um, I would say, um, the way it mimics the real world more closely. Yeah. In other words, you get a bank to reserve some money. Yeah, yeah. So it's exactly. like you to Facebook, just you know, this is what you Right. So, so the. Right, so the reservation, so I think we can influence your space coming in that sense, but as you can see, it requires multiple trips of mm. events get generated. Yeah, yeah multiple trips. Right? The and services then, get a little chatty. Like, right. yeah. But then um, in events, eventual consistency world, if I could say, um, one would say that we can look at this in terms of apology oriented. Yeah. That means you can go ahead and assume that most of your operations will succeed, and if it fails, you create uh, compensation transactions. So in the real world, for example, let's say in a warehouse, where we say that our customer want to have things in our warehouse, but then, you know, um, we could, as much as we could, gift um, transaction for the customer from our database, from our, our, te um, um, our, our technology, but in the database, what if someone breaks something? I mean, then what it's here in the database is no longer consistent with what's in the real world, and there will be a valid business flow to actually have to handle that case. So I think in eventual consistency way, we think that you know, transaction is not something that it's actually mimic the real world. If we just assume that most of things will go fine, and then we can go with the um, compensation, which has to be implemented in a well-functioning business anyways. Yep. So how do you implement this compensation? Do you create a new event? Right, so it would be like a new business Yeah, flow. like refunds or... Right. So I think in the ATM machine examples, I think it's a classic example of how we make sure that the distributed system... So let's say, like, what if the <coughs> machine ATM is disconnected from the world, then can people actually overthrow? I think banks have some implementation. I, actually, I don't, I'm not from finance, so you can no, correct it's okay. me. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You're, you're, um, so yeah, I mean, so... so uh, so it's like, yeah, so, so there's no like such thing as two-paced commit in, as far as Lagom is concerned, I think. But like, I think there's a pattern called Sagar, like right. that, that's about distributed transaction. Like it's about you're pairing your command with the, like commit with the rollback. But like, I just didn't have a necessity to actually use that yet. I mean, but we, we can actually handle all the, like, I actually never had to worry about the transaction ability when I'm, as I'm building this framework, which, which involves so many financial transactions and trading. So, uh, so, yes, so, question. so earlier you mentioned that how the T and error would just suspend the factor. Mm. So could that be a solution? Is that what you, would you suspend, say, for a single customer if you try to make a transaction? Uh, would you suspend further the event? No, no, we, we still, like, there's no such, such thing as suspension in um, Actor, like, in, in Lagom, as far as Lagom is concerned, like, we just keep receiving. But, like, for example, the example of portfolio, you know, um, so if somebody reserved, like, 90% of its cash for trading, if, if, the act, if, if the other actor actually reserved it already, and then now you have 10% remaining, and if, if another comment comes through and ask, asking to reserve 11%, but then if this guy has only 10% left. So what do you do is like, you can, so that is when, so because of time, I couldn't actually hand, um, touch based on this part, but actually when the command comes into the actor, when the command come, enters the persistent entity, we have to validate first. Because we cannot argue with the event that actually already happened. Event is something that already happened, it's a fact, we cannot argue with it. The only way to prevent for the portfolio to go negative balance is actually you have to validate the command just check if you have enough money. If you don't, just tell him to so off. You the discard the event before the we, so, so, so we... It's a command. It's a different discard. Yeah, we discard the command, yeah. And in actually, in Lagom, there is a 
CTX that invalid command method, which which you will just um, return back the error message to the to the sender. Yeah. If I could ask, uh, sure. you're building a robot advisor to mean that uh, your and, and you're using CTRS uh, to do this. So that means your market data will be flowing in, uh, flowing in as, com uh, as, as commands, mm. I think. It. So given the fact that there's a, uh, there's, uh, look, there's a significant uh, latency between the command query mm -hmm. and so on, yep. so how, 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 how would your trading strategy, I mean, do your trading strategies cope with yeah. this? Yeah. Oh, we're, not, yeah. we're not building a real-time trading platform, right? Okay. So, um, the, the, the let's say performance aspects that are certainly a, a concern, right? If you have the eventual consistency delay, um, are not that relevant for us. We're yeah. trading once per day, but it's a long-term investment strategy. We're in, actually, in fact, we're trading once per day for our entire customer base. So you know, we have enough time, more than enough time. To but in, in fact, this. if you if you want a, I mean, I I still think that Labom is a good candidate for building real-time live trading system as well. The reason is that actually. Um, it has uh, very tightly in, um, integrated with Akka Stream. For example, I showed you the message topics in my um, screenshot before, and there I was only showing the, um, the message type that, uh, sorry, the endpoint types. Your endpoint type, for example, can be a stream. Like, you know, you can actually open up a stream of communication through WebSocket, for example. And, and also, you know, you can, you can, you know, Kafka, Kafka is extremely performant. You can pop up your, you know, like, like I, I think it's a very good, good candidate for um, live trading as well. Yeah. Yes? Okay, let's say, let's say you have an actor at least that have a fund of 10,000, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say this actor is correct, uh, request coming to this actor is very active. And then you find that, okay, you need to scale this actor probably to three, two or three copies. But then, the state of it will be duplicated, right? Yes, yes. So how you maintain the state, let's say, you keep duplicating, let's say the funds keep duplicating yep. and increasing. How you keep the state, let's say, I have three copies duplicated? So that is why we're not using eventuate, right? I mean, do right. you yeah. So um, I think if you have a business model that has that entity, the only one entity that receives a lot of load. Well, basically, I'm saying that it's a single point of approval. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Understand. So if it has a lot of load, so let's say in the real world, we can, one way would be to actually think about, we can actually have to repl replicate this into actually its own entity and we implement our own uh, resolution with the real business um, flow. That means like if you have one bank teller and if this bank teller has a lot of customers, in the real world, you should have two or three bank tellers. That's one thing. But the other solution is that, I mean, if your entity receives a lot of load, you can think about how to scale your node. And if you have like a lot of entities, then with this um, Akka cluster, as you increase the number of nodes, the, there'll be less number of entities live in your application, right? And that means it is it is actually dividing the load. And as far as Alice is concerned, in Lagom, if there are two Alice at, a t at any given point of time, that's a system failure for us. Right. That's a system failure. We have to we have some error issue going on in our system if, if there are two. So errors. in fact, they are not replicated. Right? Yeah, they're that's they're the, not replicated. The, yeah, how do you, okay, not replicated. Okay, fine. Then you handle the data integrity issue, but how do you handle the scalability? Right, so... Um, yeah, like Mick described, I think you can you can scale by... Like, I think you need... To, it depends on the business uh, business problem, right? So for us, this is not really an issue because the load is quite uh, nicely distributed among all our customers. Now, it depends on what the use case is, why you have so much load on this single uh, entity, right? And then, as Mick was saying, like, you need to find a way, depending on the business problem, to break it down, like, why... Why does, for example, if like one entity receives, I don't know, let's say 90% of your traffic for some reason, then why is this happening, mm -hmm. right? Is it, is it, and then, and then find a way to kind of break it down on a business logic level, right? And then you scale kind of horizontally by breaking it apart into... Yeah, but you already found out the reason why, you already know why it's actually so, the actor is so busy, right? So you want to scale up. But then the thing that putting you back is the data integrity, right? That means that that means you have to redesign your actor. That means you have to redefine your aggregate route. So we actually had similar kind of uh, situation. So where like a rebalancing load was um, like say we have let's say we have 
28 different risk profile, like with the different allocation targets in in our statutory award. And then, but then, let's say because Singaporeans are more like a conservative investor, let's say they all, you know, go into like a, they all goes into the risk profile between eight and ten. So, so for example, if we use this risk profile number, which is one to twenty-eight, as a um, partition key um, of of ID of the actor, then then it will be. Very likely that you know these these actors with ID with between eight and ten will have like most of the traffic. So 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 you have to actually think um, like you have to actually partition it differently. Then 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 that means like I don't know. I mean I haven't actually thought about it yet. But like like you have you have to choose your partition key wisely to to distribute the load. So so. Yeah. Right. I think to add to that, I think a lot of highly distributed system, whether it's a Cassandra or um, Kafka, one of the key horizontal scaling is choosing the right partition key, yes. right? So, and I think the same should be applied when de um, modeling your business domain as well, such that, yeah, but now I'm saying before the fact, right? You're asking like, if we discovered after the fact. Um, yeah, so I think it should start with the right, and I think that's why, um, DDD driven DDD design. It's very crucial part of designing a successful um, event sourcing CQRS system. But otherwise, um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm if you are satisfied. Yet. If, if you're partitioning with say um, the individual user's surname, for example, and then if you deploy that to Korea, for example, and then <laughs> you know your actor that handles L will be like killed because there's like Half of the Koreans are Lee, you know. So you have to choose your partition key really well, and then so that it's evenly distributed. And then, so the whole point of actor is that you know it's, it's linear scalability, right? You can actually distribute the load just by creating another in actor instance. I think the point is not whether how I distribute my my, my actors or events, right? It's just that when I distribute them, I can distribute them, but once I distribute them, then I don't have a single point of truth, but it's hard to reconcile, right? Right, so... That's okay. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yes, Actually, when you, uh, I guess, model your actors, your, you know, your actor in this in the case of the long event source system is not supposed to be replicated, it's supposed to be just a lot. So, I guess when you have the aggregate rule, everything goes to the aggregate rule, and depending on how you model it, you might distribute that. Uh, to, I guess, the, the child factor. So whatever you do, you know, that's actually, I guess, your, your single source of truth. Any information you, you know, has to go through that. Yes, because when you first begin with, actor is a point where you handle concurrency, right? Yeah. So you have actor. So there are thousands of threats coming in, making coming requests, and this guy is the one that seek, seek, uh, make everything in sequence, yeah. right? So that, okay, it's fine. Right, it works. So then one day you realize that oh, you, there are overloaded over -load with requests. So you probably create two two actors living in two JVM in two servers, different servers physically, right? Then you find that oh, I got this problem. They, you know, the single point of truth cannot be reconciled. That that to me sounds more like a stateless actor, like like you know like you just create an actor to process and distribute the request, and the actor doesn't necessarily have a um, the state. Yes, but I need to keep the state, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a counter right. deducting something, right? So I think to your example, I think maybe looking to something like event rate might be a reasonable choice because it is replicated um, um, event source actor and it has API, nice APIs to allow you to resolve the conflicts. And if it is a counter, that's even simpler because you can model it as a CRDT where it's um, I think add only like monotonically increasing. So I think if that is one of your problem, maybe Hardy can give the talk next time about event rate. Yeah. <laughs> so I think of course this is not one size fit all, right? Yeah. So but, sure. Yep. Uh, how would you model uh, event commands but in the case where a user transfers money to another another user? So presumably yeah. these these two be uh, separate actors and issuing commands to both of them, but uh, some might be rejected, one might be rejected and the other might succeed. But so ah. both 
like one actor transferring its money to the other actor. Right. So that that sounds like uh, like that to me that sounds like you know even in real world you need a broker in between. So I'll probably map a come up with a concept of broker actor or something transfer actor something like that that actually um, you know controls these transactions. Okay. Yeah, we have similar problem in Redmart and we basically our solution was to go with a packet cluster as well. We needed right. to have you know a not very loaded system but you know for availability purposes we needed to have two well two instances of stateful actor basically and we tried a couple of solutions that we discussed. Basically, add a cluster to the system. You just have one act, one state cluster in a cluster, and cluster just ensures availability. When the actor goes down, it is just just add a cluster. So just, okay. just one instance, you know, running somewhere on multiple nodes. Okay, that's it. Mm. If you need performance, there's probably you know we are just begging on that. Um, yeah, I've got it. Question, probably subject to one. What are your experience with backup clusters? Some non trivial areas that kind of thing. For me, I, I am completely happy with it. For me, it's a, still a new world. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm still learning a cluster, and actually, the like the way how they these actors form into different nodes, I'm, I'm still actually learning them. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean. We're not live yet, right? So we're running this. <laughs> in, uh, we're we're getting close to to launch. Um, I'm sure you know once we're live, it will be we'll learn a lot more and a lot faster. <laughs> but yeah. Maybe we can call you then. <laughs> <laughs> Our best expert is off to do something else. Okay. About oh. other cluster, cluster we are also not in, not on live. Yeah. Right. right. We have, we have something in, in, in tops. Yeah. yeah. Like cluster. And it works. It works. Yeah, it works. It's not like if it failed, uh -huh. we are not in shit. But, <laughs> but it works. I have a feeling that you know, like uh, the simplistic way to resolve this. Questions around Aka cluster is just buying the conduct our subscription. <laughs> I, probably that's why there are not many resources available online. I mean, so I don't know. The previous input which I heard that there is no working really big Aka cluster in the world. All of them are failed. So really? each and every company yeah, invented something on on their own. I mean, no, I actually, follow. I've heard that too. No, actually, PayPal is distributing like 8 billion transactions per day using 7 JVMs running ACA clusters, no? Which one? Uh, PayPal? Like, no? no. no? Definitely not. No? <laughs> but, like, it's controversial information, so we don't figure out. <laughs> Maybe we just spend a lot of time implementing business logic, so we just haven't had like the dev to actually investigate. But yeah, we would love any sharing about Aka cluster in this meetup. Yeah. I think it would be helpful for the community. Yeah. We have one Aka cluster, as, as we mentioned, which is working. It's just it's just not critical for business. So, right. but anyway, it's working. To remove this uh, split brain problem, there's, the only thing was uh, done just increasing the latency to check whether the nodes are. It helps, but it's this particular key. Okay. We will see yeah. later. They had some problems with restart. Yeah. Something like when it, you when you turn the cluster down, it starts to record nodes down, no down, relax, 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 and it's total panic in the cluster. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm panicking now. <laughs> it's promising. Anyway, it's promising technology. It's promising knowledge, sure. sure. but still need. I mean, get more experience. And, and I honestly don't see many other alternatives out there. I mean, so we either. Hmm? That's we either. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, why so we move into yeah. this. And then that, that is why we're looking for senior DevOps as well. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Cool. Uh, yep. Uh, I have a question about DevOps itself. Basically, you use Kafka and uh, Cassandra, right? Yes. I know. Is it locked into this tool? My understanding, Kafka is the message queue, then Cassandra is the data layer, then can we see it? Um, I think 
event log is locked, right? With Cassandra node. No, I you think can, you can still use. Yeah, they use J, right. They allow us. They allow you to um, use JDBC yeah. for the persistent layer, but for the um, Kafka broker layer, no, okay, I think yeah. you probably can. But I think it's just the f support, the API support that it has for now. Um, with the offset maintenance, mm. it's only with Kafka. But I can imagine a custom built solution, because I think the Kaf the PubSub side it's a little more distanced from the actually core of CQRS and event sourcing. Mm. Okay, uh, Lagoon doesn't support the other than Kafka. But do, do they easy to replace it? I checked the broker API is actually agnostic. Ah, thank you. But practically speaking, they only have to have the implementation right now. Right. They accept patches, so. So is Lagoon written entirely in Scala? I think so, right? I mean, Scala, a little bit of, mostly Scala, a little bit of Java, I think. Yeah, I think the underlying it's it's Scala, but they do provide both APIs and yeah, Java. Java came up first. Yep. So yeah. I was shocked actually. Yeah. What is it? Fluent really in Scala. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's where the money is. See you. See you. Yeah. To another Scala like said, that priorities on Java even for the right. Scala. Right. Right. Really I have a question about your domain boundaries. Yep. Uh, so it sounds like you have to get your boundaries right. From yes. The start, right? But how do you feel Lagoon is uh, giving you flexibility to extend it in the future? So for example, your customers in the future could have different tiers. Yep. You have basic, gold, and platinum. Right. right. And maybe some would have priority for their comments, stuff like that. Right? So how, you, how confident are you that you could uh, implement this kind of new constraints uh, in your existing model mm. with Lagoon? Right. I, I think within its own model, I think it allows for a very easy extension because basically you just define a richer representation of your domain. Okay. And then if your feature is actually an add-on, it shouldn't interfere with the past events. So basically yeah. you can think of this as just once you have the new feature, you have a new types of event stream. Yeah, actually, that right, I mean, but I see potential uh, problem with that. Actually, so let's say we have a customer service. Yeah. And then let's say we already define the customer entity, and then customer entity is identified by its own ID. And then later on, if we introduce the membership, like a gold customer, uh, silver customer, um, if, if this differentiation introduce a uh, huge um, changes in the customer state itself, I think it's going to be a problematic because like that means we have to, um, we have to build another um, entity that represent the different type of customer, like a gold customer entity, but then, but then there could be a potential like duplications in ID and like, and, and, and especially if this new feature is added later in the time, it could be a potential problem. But if it's just a, if it's just just a attribute that explains the characteristic of this customer entity, I don't see why we can't just introduce as an enum field in our state. And then enum, like like just enum field is in a state, and 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 implement different logics in our command handlers. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, so, do you foresee that you might have to rewrite and the entire event is just because you made a big API change? I think that would be a really bad design from the get go. <laughs> um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, how should I? Actually, you know what? If that's the case, I'll actually create a new service. I mean, like, like, like I'll I'll actually plan to retire this old entity that has very incorrectly defined event set. Just I don't know, maybe keep them running, but like I'll create another entity with a better design, and then. And then actually sync them. I don't know. Like I haven't, I haven't been there yet. So I, th yeah. I think that's I think that's the same kind of major migration that you have to do in traditional database, anyways. Like in any huge schema change, it's always a pain. And yep. 
how do you ensure that, say, the read replay matches what the, uh, the, the, what the actor does as well? Right, so. And especially in the middle, there's a the development of migration. So to the first part, it's that so events should be something that has happened. That means that when the events are mutating the state, it shouldn't create more source of divergence. That means when the event was persisted, almost your final answer should should be there too. So because it's um, an immutable thing that um, has already been been pers has already been. So I guess uh, so, uh, the problem is what happens if it's your program that has changed. Instead of having uh, 1.500 once, you're adding 1.5. Maybe because wrong issue. So the well, program has changed. Yeah. How, how could that happen? I mean, like, because the event is immutable. Uh, so you're talking about, like, what if what if the event log actually get corrupted? Uh, no, I think. Uh, well, you, you, you have a sequence of events. Yes. I think uh, for me, uh huh. But uh, 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 <laughs> just uh, just to lunch and <laughs> joining stash away. I think it would help you to philosophize about life and eventual consistency. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Joe, Nick, and Nino for uh, running the talk, and thanks to Lozada for.